कुछ इस तरह है कि वी हैव अ मैग्नेट इनसाइड द मैग्नेट वी मैग्नेट प्लेस आर सैंपल व्हिच कंटेन्स आर सॉल्यूशन ऑफ इंटरेस्ट आर लिक्विड ऑफ इंटरेस्ट और सॉलिड ऑफ इंटरेस्ट अराउंड द सैंपल देयर इज अ प्रोब दिस बेसिकली एन एलसी सर्किट व्हिच इज ट्यूनेबल बिकॉज़ दीस कैपेसिटर्स कैन बी ट्यून ऑलराइट एंड वी हैव अ स्विच व्हिच इज कॉल्ड अ डुप्लेक्सर that can make this probe act as a transmitter or a receiver if you were to act as a transmitter that is we want to apply a pulse a 90 degree pulse a 45 degree pulse a 180 degree pulse or a pulse of arbitrary flip angle or and phase we have a synthesizer which is just a fancy name for a function generator whose phase can be controlled so we have a phase shifter this transmit pulse goes here there is a switch on off switch that is controlled by a pulse programmer uh, so you you make a pulse sequence you put it into the computer and the computer is programmed in such a way that it can control the switch you have an amplifier so that the applied voltage can be increased and then it goes through the duplexer into the probe and once you want to turn on the acquisition that is you want to receive the signal the r segment comes on the same coaxial line it is now the pulse programmer tells the spectrometer that you have to go into the receive mode the signal is routed in through this pre amplifier the signal that is coming from the uh, nmr sample is very small so you have to amplify it once you amplify it it goes into a receiver in the receiver it is multiplied with a cosine uh, wave of with, with a particular reference frequency so that you down convert you have a low pass filter then you get the real and the imaginary channels and these are then converted in an adc into digital signal and then you, have, you can apply an arbitrary phase shift and in a computer you can take a fourier transform and display the probe so this is an overview of what a spectrometer looks like and here are some pictures uh, of commercial spectrometers after they have of course outlived their life so we have a central bore the bore is here and the sample is generally inserted from the top of the magnet so you put your sample here there is an air cushion that lifts the sample that prevents it, it from falling down and when you want the sample to come down to gradually lower the air pressure so that the sample to comes down slowly and it locks in here so what is this this is just a duer with an outer jacket which is filled with liquid nitrogen in order to prevent thermal shocks you have an inner jacket which has liquid helium and inside the liquid helium you have your superconducting solenoid and your sample is placed right here So here you expect a, a B naught field of a certain magnitude, and you want the field to be sufficiently homogeneous and strong. And the strength of that field, of course, determines the Lambda frequency. But a very important requirement in commercial NMR for chemical applications or for biochemical applications is that the field has to be sufficiently homogeneous. We will now we will later <coughs> see today what happens if the field is inhomogeneous. So. liquid nitrogen is generally is cheap so it boils off there are safety vents at the at the top so liquid nitrogen keeps on leaking so you have to refill your duer with liquid nitrogen after every week or two weeks or a month depending upon the holding capacity of this duer but liquid helium you do, you do not want any boil off so you want the liquid helium to stay there for years and years and if your vacuum is good if your seals are good it will indeed stay okay. and any liquid helium that is boiled off you want to recover it you don't want to throw it into the air you want to liquefy it again so that you can re reuse it so it's just a sophisticated thermos we the nmr magnet okay so how big so it depends upon if you want a strong magnet ये होगा तकरीबन अगर अब नए मैग्नेट्स छोटे भी आ गए हैं लेकिन ये होगा कोई फाइव फीट करते आ जाओ 
छोटे भी हैं लेकिन अब इफ यू वॉन्ट अ कॉम्पैक्ट मैगनेट यू द गोल इज टू मेक स्मॉल एंड स्मॉलर मैगनेट एंड गेट अ गुड होमोजेनस फील्ड दैट्स नेक्स्ट दैट्स द रीसन ट्रेंड इन एन एम आर रिसर्च और फिर एक दूसरी बात ये कि इसके गेट ना जो पुराने मैगनेट से इनकी जो मैग्नेटिक फील्ड थी वो एक्सटेंड करती थी ड्यूअर के बाद सो so, इस मैग्नेट के गिर्द आप एक सर्कल ड्रॉ करते हैं कि इस सर्कल के अंदर फाइव गॉज फील है ऑन एवरेज सो वेन यू आर डूइंग एन एन एम आर एक्सपेरिमेंट यू जनरली डू नॉट टेक मेटल वेयर विद यू यू डू नॉट टेक यू क्रेडिट कार्ड्स और स्मार्ट कार्ड्स बिकॉज द इंफॉर्मेशन विल बी वाइक आउट एंड यू डू नॉट टेक एनी फेरस और मेटेलिक और मैग्नेटिक टूल्स विद यू बिकॉज द टूल्स द फील्ड इज सो स्ट्रॉन्ग द टूल्स कैन बी पुश इन टू दी इन टू द मैगनेट and they can cause severe damage there have been many fatal accidents with nmr not because of the cryogenics but simply because a tool or a or, or a metallic chair has been pulled into the magnet so it's very important that when, when you go to a hospital for an mri scan the technicians are generally trained in handling patients and the patients generally they do not love to wear any jewelry or they not love to carry magnetic cards you cannot do an mri with a patient who has a pacemaker or who has an artificial metallic joint or prosthesis so mri is a is not allowed for such patients so here is another view of a magnet it's a 600 megahertz magnet there are two companies in the world Brooker and Varian, which are the most famous companies, Varian has now been bought by another company, Agenent. So, so now the two big companies are Brooker and Agenent. This is a 600 megahertz magnet, and you see the higher the field, the bigger the magnet becomes as a general rule of thumb, and it becomes more costlier. So this magnet is so big that you have to take stairs. Now these are non-metallic stairs, stairs or aluminium stairs, which are non-magnetic. So you climb up the stairs. put your sample at the top uh, there is an air cushion that can make a sample hover then you lower the pressure the sample comes down and it locks inside the magnet at the appropriate place these are safety vents which allow for excess boil off of nitrogen and helium all right so where is the probe you need a probe as well so that radiation pulse can be transmitted and received that probe goes down from the bottom goes down from the bottom up pressure air pressure air pressure koi itna pressure up it's a very high pressure uh, current which can hold a test tube at the top i don't remember what the exact pressure is it must be 100 psi why do you need to the suction pump to bring the sample Because the sample will fall down, it can uh, touch the wall. It can break. With the, you have a glass tube. It can break. And once a tube breaks inside the probe, it's a very difficult job getting all the shrapnel out and all the glass pieces out. You don't want the sample to break inside the tube, inside the probe. So you could have had something that would, you know, like yeah, lift it properly. The <coughs> tube inside, which goes up, there's. Of course, you can have air. That's what they have. They have an air lifter, an air piston. You can have anything you like. You can uh, in experiments we did we were not we could not have air, so we had uh, a test tube which was bound from a thread and just lowered the thread. So, and you need to have some mechanism of loading and unloading the sample. So this is a big magnet, a 900 megahertz magnet. The world record these days is about a 1 gigahertz magnet. But high field, what does high field translate to? Questions. So high field से क्या advantage है? और क्या डिसएडवांटेज हो सकते हैं आई फील से फर्क क्या पड़ता है आप बताइए आप बताइए आई फील से पहले बताओ सिंपली हमने तीन लेक्चर्स में देखा हमने फर्क क्या पड़ा है फ्रीक्वेंसी फील्ड को हाई करने क्या होगा? बी पर बी नॉट पर है ठीक है फिर अब तो बी नॉट पर है फिर भी जैसे पर जाएंगे 
It has to do with the Lamo frequency. Increasing the frequency increases the Lamo frequency, correct? What happened with the Lamo frequency increase? The spacing between the levels increases. Agree? At a given temperature, there is a higher population difference that is created. Because that polarization is given by H bar mega over KT. So higher the spacing between the levels, Higher is the population difference at a given temperature. Higher the population difference means greater is the strength <coughs> of IZ in the thermal equilibrium state. Greater the strength of IZ, greater is the strength of IX or IY. And greater is then the magnetization which is detected. In fact, the sensitivity depends not only on the magnetic field but on the square of the magnetic field. Because you have, you are using the derivative of magnetization which is being detected, which is an EMF. So the derivative of a magnetization gives a magnetization itself or, and that depends on the field. So the sensitivity depends on B squared. So higher the field, higher the sensitivity. You can use smaller samples, nanoliter size samples, picoliter size samples and get some sizable signal out of it. So that's the advantage of NMR. And beware, I heard the word resolution. Resolution of sensitivity में बड़ा फर्क है। NMR field बढ़ाने से sensitivity बढ़ जाएगी, signals की peaks बड़ी-बड़ी आनी शुरू हो जाएंगी। लेकिन उसका ये मतलब है कि इसमें इनकी resolution बढ़ जाएगी। Resolution और तरीकों से बढ़ेगी, field बढ़ाने से भी chemical shift resolution बढ़ेगी। लेकिन resolution within a peak का primary cause homogeneity है। So resolution is increased in other ways, which I will explain. But there is a difference between sensitivity and resolution. So you want to go, if you want to do NMR of a complicated molecule, you would like to go to higher fields. The reason I will explain. But as a general rule, higher the field, higher will be the sensitivity. And you should be able to answer these simple questions. Okay? So this is 900 MHz spectrometer. Or this is a special camera. Banana pada. ठीक है ये देखो ये वेंट्स हैं आम तौर पर ये बेसमेंट में होता है कि अगर हीलियम लीक कर जाए हीलियम लाइटर है एयर से तो हीलियम रूम के सिंक नहीं करती रूम में रूम के ऊपर रहती है फ्लोट करती है इसलिए नीचे ऑक्सीजन का मॉनिटी रहती है तो अगर आप लेट्स हैं तो आप ऑक्सीजन मिलती है लेकिन अगर इतनी ज़्यादा हीलियम हो जाए तो पूरा रूम फिल हो जाएगा आपको एस्टिक्सिया हो सकता है तो यहाँ पे अलार्म सिस्टम होते हैं हीलियम डिटेक्टर होते हैं एंड सोन अच्छा अब इस सारी पल्सेस के आने जाने को कंट्रोल करने के लिए आपको इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स की जरूरत है ये पल्स प्रोग्राम है जिसने आर एफ पल्स फेंकनी है और रिसीव करना है उससे नॉइज को रिमूव करना है अप्रोप्रिएट फिल्टरिंग करनी है डाउन कन्वर्जन करनी है याद है ना पिछला लेक्चर तो उसके लिए पूरी एक सफिस्टिकेटेड एक रेडियो है ये सफिस्टिकेटेड रेडियो जो जनरली कॉल कॉन्सोल ठीक है उसकी ये तस्वीर है और आखिरी बात है प्रोब की तो प्रोब ये नीचे से इंसर्ट होती है और ऊपर से जो टेस्ट ट्यूब आ रही होती है सैंपल की वो यहां आके फिक्स हो जाती है और ये सारे आपके यहां पे ट्यूनिंग कैपेसिटर्स लगे हैं ये नीचे से आप उन रॉड्स हैं जो कैपेसिटर्स को ट्यून कर सकते हैं सो यू हैव टू ट्यून एंड मैच दिस प्रोब तो तीन चीजों से मिलकर बनता है स्पेक्ट्रोमीटर मैग्नेट कंसोल या ट्रांसीवर और प्रोब अच्छा 
अच्छा अब हम बात करते हैं रिलैक्सेशन की दो तरह की रिलैक्सेशन होती है हमने ये देखा कि वेन एवर स्पिन इज फ्लिप ऑन टू द एक्टोरियल प्लेन यू स्टार्ट विद आई सी यू गेट आई एक्स एंड आई वाई देन ओके लेट्स ड्रॉ अ सिंपल सिंपल पल्स एक्सपेरिमेंट You have a 90 degrees pulse and 90 degrees x pulse. Okay. Initial state आपके पास क्या है? Initial state क्या? I C. I C. ठीक है? After the application of this pulse, you get y x minus i y. Here you have minus i y. And looking at the density matrix of i y. We know that it is going to give us a signal. So if you open the flood gates of your acquisition here, you will get an NMR signal. Okay? So this is your signal. And we saw that this signal is proportional to exponent i omega e. Now what? This is telling us is that if we keep the acquisition running for infinity, this signal will go on till infinity, and the spins will keep on precessing in the x y plane uninterrupted without any alteration in their precession. So we should be getting a signal for an infinitely long period of time. So far, this is what we've learned, but there are reasons to suggest otherwise. This. The spins have to relax, and this signal, which is being estimated as being proportional to this eternal function, to this function that lasts forever, is actually decaying in time. So the signal has to decay. So a more appropriate expression for this signal is exponent i. Omega p, where omega is the offset frequency with a certain decay time. This signal has to decay with time. So we put in a decay term, exponent minus t over, let's call it some capital T, a characteristic decay time. And this means that the peak height of this signal follows an envelope which decreases with time. And the time constant of this envelope is capital T. So this is the basic process of relaxation. Now there are two kinds of relaxation in spin systems, and it's very important to study these relaxation types for understanding an NMR spectrum. Abhi tak clear hui baat? Pehli type hai spin lattice relaxation. Usko aam taur par T1 relaxation kya dete hain, or spin spin relaxation. इसको T2 रिलैक्सेशन कहते हैं। अच्छा एक बात याद रखें, इनसाइड यू टेस्ट ट्यूब, यू हैव अ लार्ज नंबर ऑफ स्पिन्स। इफ यू हैव अ सॉल्यूशन, इस योर स्पिन स्टैटिक इन टाइम, इट इस, द स्पिन इस अ पार्ट ऑफ अ मॉलिक्यूल, एंड व्हाट्स हैपनिंग टू द मॉलिक्यूल? द मॉलिक्यूल इस डिफ्यूजिंग the molecule is undergoing some translational motion, rotational motion. Right? If your spin, your proton is on a methyl group in an organic compound, that methyl group is undergoing rotations. It's undergoing libations. So there is some motion that is always taking place. So the spin, and the spin is also a part of a molecule. And every molecule, the molecule comprises electrons and atoms and nuclei. So, if you focus your attention on one spin, even though the field, the B0 field is static, it will not experience a uniform field. Right? Because the field is being textured by the local environment, by the electron cloud. Besides, the field can never be made absolutely uniform. So the effect of all of this is that this B field, the B naught field, is not pointing in a in a fixed direction. It's quivering about it, about a certain axis. It's quivering, okay? Okay. 
तो उस क्विवरिंग की वजह से इसकी जो प्रोसेशनल मोशन है व्हेन द क्विवर एंगल चेंजेस द एक्सिस ऑफ रोटेशन इज आल्सो चेंजिंग फॉर द प्रोसेशन सो द स्पिन दैट वाज फर्स्ट मूविंग इन एन इक्वेटोरियल प्लेन इन द एक्स वाई प्लेन नाउ टिल्ट्स अवे फ्रॉम द एक्स वाई प्लेन लिटिल बिट यू कैन गो डाउनवर्ड्स अपवर्ड्स सो देयर इज ऑलवेज सम क्विवरिंग मोशन और क्विवरिंग प्रोसेशन associated with fluctuating magnetic fields no spin can see a magnetic field that is constant either in time or in space all right but we know that what happens in a state of thermal equilibrium is that spins are not pointing in the same direction you you agree with me because we have a mixed state because of the temperature because of thermal agitation the spins are pointing in random directions so the equilibrium density matrix is identity over 2 plus some epsilon iz and this is a mixed state and all the spins are not pointing along the z direction but there is a net magnetic moment parallel to z corresponding to the iz magnetization correct ye ek net magnetic moment hai so this is what happened in the state of thermal equilibrium now spins want to achieve equilibrium if you increase the magnetic field this magnetization must go up agree because this factor goes up this factor the epsilon factor or the polarization factor is h bar omega over 4 kbt you increase the field omega goes up this polarization goes up the iz component goes up and the magnetization mz is simply proportional to the trace of rho equilibrium with iz to picking up the iz component theek hai in fact you can make this an equality by writing gamma the gyromagnetic ratio the density of spins trace rho equilibrium iz So changing the magnetic field magnitude can increase or decrease the magnetic moment, the magnetization of the sample. Changing the direction of the magnetic field will change the direction of this magnetization as well. So once you have equilibrium, once you have a magnetic field, spins want to be in a state of equilibrium, correct? What if the field is zero? What is the equilibrium state for the spins there? You this term goes to zero. You will have a maximally mixed state. The spin vector will be pointing randomly in all different directions, so you will get no net magnetization. The sample will be unmagnetized. Correct? All right. Now suppose you have a field that is zero. At a certain point in time, you switch on the field. The field goes up. Now this zero has been established at minus infinity. Now uh, this field zero is established at minus infinity. So the equilibrium state for the magnetization at zero field is zero. Correct. Now when you switch on the field, the magnetization does not automatically switch go up to a certain value, just like a staircase. It has to exponentially go up. This phenomenon is called T1 relaxation or spin lattice relaxation. बोलो 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 सो कहता है एक्सपोनेंशियल नहीं है एक्सपोनेंशियल ही है तुम मुझे नहीं बता दिए किस तरह एक्सपोनेंशियल ही है अब इसकी एक्सप्रेशन भी देख लो कोई बात नहीं ठीक है ठीक है तो दिस फिनोमेनन इज कॉल्ड रिलैक्सेशन एंड दिस इज एन एग्जांपल ऑफ स्पिन लैटिस रिलैक्सेशन और टी1 रिलैक्सेशन लाइकवाइज इफ द फील्ड इज ऑन एंड इट्स इट्स स्विचड ऑफ एट अ सर्टेन टाइम the magnetization has to gradually has to decay exponentially almost exponentially so the expression for this growth of magnetization is mz is proportional to 1 minus exponent minus t over t1 the characteristic time scale of this growth is t1 
the exponential grab the magnetization exponentially grows to its equilibrium value here the equilibrium value is zero so the initial magnetization exponentially decays with a characteristic time scale called t1 so the decay curve can be expressed by this expression अभी जो टी वन है ना ये करेक्टरिस्टिक टाइम स्केल है स्पिंग्स का और ये बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट पैरामीटर है और एनएमआर और दूसरी स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी की टेक्निक्स में फर्क ये है कि टी वन इज लॉन्ग कैन बी ऑफ द ऑर्डर ऑफ सेकेंड्स वेर एज इन अदर टेक्निक्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल वाइब्रेशनल स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी और रोटेशनल स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी दिस टी वन इज स्मॉल ऑफ द ऑर्डर ऑफ मिली सेकेंड्स देखो हम एन एम आर में एक जनरल रूल ऑफ थम बता रहा हूं एन एम आर में हम न्यूक्लियर स्पिन के साथ डील कर रहे हैं रामन स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी में या यूवी बिस स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी में एफ टी आई आर में वी डीलिंग विद इधर द इलेक्ट्रॉन्स और द मॉलिक्यूल एज अ होल एंड नाउ न्यूक्लियस इज अ वेरी आइसोलेटेड एंड एन इंसुलेटेड एंटिटी मोस्ट ऑफ केमिस्ट्री इज डन विद इलेक्ट्रॉन्स especially the elect the valence electrons but the nucleus is very well shielded is insulated or isolated from chemical interaction so whatever magnetization or whatever the spin polarization on the nucleus it stays there for longer okay so t1 for nmr is long acha ab hum agar ye ek experiment kare Now this is a pulse sequence. Now what we have learned in the previous three <coughs> lectures is now being applied. How do we measure T1? Okay. How do you measure magnetization? So you measure the NMR signal. You understand that? That is what we are measuring. We are measuring a time-dependent magnetization. We are measuring Mx. the magnetization by the rate of change of the magnetization through a faraday coil so i think that's what we learned in the previous lectures through a through a faraday coil all right now let me first show you a spectrum now this uh, molecule xylene is the methyl group ortho methyl So this is meta xylene, and you look at different carbons. These carbons are labeled C1, C3, C2, C5, C4, and C6. Now different carbon atoms on this benzene aromatic ring, and we talked about carbon 13 nuclei, not carbon 12 nuclei. There are only five nuclei which give you, which are spin half in the periodic table, in the natural, uh, and not even in the natural abundance. Five. common nuclear ठीक है one of them is of course hydrogen or kya hai carbon 13 carbon 12 has a spin zero you cannot do nmr with carbon 12 so you only work with the carbon 13 which occurs at a natural abundance of about 1% or you can synthesize a molecule which is enriched in the carbon 13 isotope ठीक है अनदर इंपॉर्टेंट न्यूक्लियस इज फ्लोरिन ठीक है और फॉस्फोरस थर्टी वन नाइट्रोजन पांच न्यूक्लियाई के साथ कॉमनली यू डू एनएमआर द मोस्ट कॉमन फॉर्म ऑफ एनएमआर इज प्रोटॉन एनएमआर फॉलोड बाय कार्बन 13 एनएमआर फ्लोरीन एनएमआर इज गेनिंग मोर एंड मोर प्रोटॉन्स वी हैव फास्फोरस 31 एनएमआर एंड नाइट्रोजन एनएमआर फॉर एग्जांपल फॉर डिटेक्शन ऑफ एक्सप्लोसिव्स यूज फास्फोरस 31 एनएमआर बिकॉज़ एक्सप्लोसिव्स सच एज गन पाउडर जनरली हैव फास्फोरस इन देम फॉर you can even calcium nmr but calcium has to be enriched 
you can do nitrogen NMR. Fluorine NMR is also gaining more predominance. So these are the five nuclei, the spin half nuclei with which you generally do spin half NMR. There are many spins, many isotopes, such as deuterium, which is spin one, and you can do NMR with spin one nuclei as well, or spin three by two nuclei as well. Those are called quadrupole nuclei, but these are beyond the scope of this course. Now, in this particular molecule, we have suppose this is an enriched molecule, a molecule that is enriched with carbon thirteen. Now, the carbon thirteen can occur at different positions. All right, so. If we consider C1 and C3, they are occurring at a different uh, precessional frequency, at a different Lamo frequency. I will explain this later. But suppose that all of these carbons are acting at different, they have different Lamo frequencies. Okay? Now C1 and C3 coincide because C1 and C3 are equivalent nuclei. There is no difference between C1 and C3. Likewise, there is no difference between C4 and C6. They're totally chemically and magnetically equivalent, and we'll have more to say about equivalence in the next lecture. But these different carbon atoms have their own Lamo frequencies, and that I'll explain in a while. <coughs> but if we do an experiment in which we apply a 180 degree pulse, we apply a 180 degree pulse, and we wait for some amount of time, and then apply a 90 degree pulse and measure the spectrum. This is what we get. So the first spectrum is when the delay between the 180 degree pulse and the 90 degree pulse is 0 second. So in effect you are applying a 180 degree pulse followed by a 90 degree pulse. Okay. And then you gradually you perform another experiment. Okay. signal so that the system regains equilibrium, so that we can perform a new experiment. Correct? How long will you have to wait? According to the diagram, few seconds. According to the diagram, exactly, a few seconds. <laughs> and this is 30 seconds. So, if you have a fair idea of T1, you will generally have to wait for 5 times T1. So that equilibrium is re-established. Okay? You understand the T1 to equilibrium re-establish. Generally, you have to wait 5 times T1. Or let's say you perform one experiment, then you perform your next experiment in which you increment this delay a little bit. And you perform a series of experiments. Now what you have seen is that if we just focus on this peak, this peak was pointing downwards. And then as you incremented the time and performed a series of experiments, this peak started decreasing in magnitude and then started pointing in the opposite direction. And if you plot, take one peak, find the integral of that peak or height of that peak and plot it with this incremental time tau, you get different points on this curve in different experiments, you get a curve like this. You understand this point? Sir? Is it equilibrium established or is it So the system has to keep a record of the previous history. I was either or I was here or I was here. I mean, then you have to refresh it again. It will refresh it again. So every time you are performing this experiment, let's do, a pro let's do a product operator state analysis of this experiment. Every experiment is starting off with the state IZ. Because and the experiment starts off in the thermal equilibrium state, which is proportional to IC. Now you, you do a 180 degree pulse with phase X. What do you get? Minus I. Okay. Now IZ does not precess in the equatorial plane. Agree? Because it's along the axis of the field. So what can happen is that it relaxes back to its equilibrium state IZ. So you wait for a time tau. You wait for some time tau. This state minus IZ tends to go back to IZ. 
agree? Minus I Z. This is your equilibrium spin operator I Z, and this is what you have achieved by the application of a 180 degree pulse. Now this magnetization tends to go back to I Z because of spin lattice relaxation, because the equilibrium state is I Z. Agree? Now, this is your out of equilibrium state minus IZ and you want to go back to IZ. So you should be able to write an equation for this. And if you write the equation, the new state after waiting for a time tau is given by Does this make sense? At tau equals 0, this term is minus, this term is 1, 1 minus 2 is minus i z. So your state is indeed minus i z. At tau infinity, this term is 0. So your state is i z. So this expression is the expression for this curve. Now, uh, this state observable? Is this an observable state? Can you get any? Signal from this state? If you write the density matrix term, do you have any off diagonal terms? No. So you have to tip it into the x y plane to get some signal out of it. So that's when you apply a 90 degree pulse. And when you apply a 90 degree pulse along, in our case, the x axis, your signal is minus i y, your state is minus i y, 1 minus 2 exponent minus tau over d1. Now if you write the density matrix for i by, so let's write it for minus i by. Minus i by is, is a half, right? So there is an off diagonal term. There is an off diagonal term. And this off diagonal term will give you a peak. And what's the frequency of that signal? Omega whatever the rotating frame frequency is. And the magnitude will be proportional to this. So by fitting this expression to this curve, you can find out the value of capital P1. You can find out the relaxation time. This is called an inversion recovery experiment. That's how you find out the P1. You had a question? So we should have a 2 over there as well? So would you have directly proportionality? Proportionality, yeah. Okay. So, A A is the magnitude of this term. So the magnitude of this term is being modulated by this expression. So A is practically speaking a plot of this expression. So this is through an inversion recovery experiment how you can find T1, the spin lattice relaxation. Water, pure water, liquid water, doubly deionized water will have a very long deep one, maybe of the order of minutes. Carbon 13 nuclei have a very long relaxation time. So, if you want to do experiments again and again, and you want those experiments to restart in equilibrium, you generally have to put in some paramagnetic salt such as manganese chloride or iron chloride into your water sample so that the T1 can be decreased and you can repeat your experiments quickly. So, the Mukhtalif peaks and Mukhtalif relaxation time, every peak is following the same trend, decreasing and then increasing slowly. So, each of these rows represents one different distinct experiment with a different value of tower. And you find out that the different peaks have different relaxation times. Now the question is that why do these carbon 13 peaks appear at different lava frequencies? This is something which is abated for the time being and we will address this. Ye toh baat ho ke the longitudinal magnetization regrows. 
longitudinal magnetization regrows. Now suppose you have an MX and an MY signal, a magnetization along X and a magnetization along Y. This is your NMR signal that comes from your coil. Agreed? And as I mentioned, this does not last forever. This has to decay. Now there are two reasons for this decay. One reason is that the magnetization has to go back to the z-axis because of longitudinal relaxation. So when it goes back to the z-axis, the, the length of this magnetization vector cannot increase. So the projection along the xy plane has to decrease. That's one reason. So this magnetization decays because of T1 relaxation. Agreed? Dekho, T1 relaxation is not understand. Ab dekho. T1 relaxation says that any magnetization has to come back to its equilibrium value. Now, suppose you apply a 90 degree pulse, you have an Ix uh, spin vector. Now, this is precessing. There is an Ix component and an Iy component. Now this magnetization has to come back to the z-axis. Now when it comes back to the z-axis, the projection along the xy plane gradually decreases. So one reason for the decay of transverse magnetization is simply the spin lattice relaxation. Okay. But there is another process which is called spin-spin relaxation, which is the second kind of relaxation that we are going to study. And if this signal did not decay, this peak would be very sharp. This peak would be infinitely sharp, infinitesimally sharp if this signal never decayed. But that violates the uncertainty principle. So this signal has to decay. And when it decays, this peak broadens up a little bit. And the faster it decays, the faster it decays, the broader the peak is. So the, this, peak, uh, this peak width is called the full width at half maximum. Are you familiar with this term? Full width at half maximum. You have a maximum signal, maximum peak. You go to half of the maximum and find out the full width. Full width at half maximum. FWHM. So this full width half maximum is inversely proportional to P2. The longer the T2, the sharper the peak. The shorter the T2, that is the faster the relaxation, the bigger the peak. Now, another look at the transverse decay. So, you apply a pulse, the magnetization is now in the equatorial plane. With time, the, the length of the magnetization vector does not change in the equatorial plane. But if the magnetization decays, the length of this vector in the equatorial plane decreases. And there are two reasons for this. One, some of the magnetization is going back to the, along the z-axis and that is the T1 process. The second reason is spin-spin relaxation. And what is meant by the spin-spin relaxation? Agar aap kisi dukaan mein jain, और कीमती तरीन दस घड़ियां खरीदे कीमती तरीन दस घड़ियां खरीदे और जो हर घड़ी शुरू में यूनिवर्सल टाइम से सिंक्रोनाइज हुई है तो ऑल ऑफ दिस क्लॉक्स विल स्टार्ट इन सिंक दे विल बी इन फेस सो नाउ यू हैव एन एनएमआर सैंपल विद अ लार्ज नंबर ऑफ स्पिन्स राइट एंड सपोज यू अप्लाई नाइंटी � so all your spins are moving together and your magnetization is in the along the say the x-axis. Now all of the spins are starting in phase but with time all of these spins will not have the same Lama frequency. They will not have the same Lama frequency because number one the field is inhomogeneous. The field can never be made purely homogeneous. So spins in different regions will have different Lama frequencies. Second, each spin is present inside a molecule and its environment dictates what the field at that spin is. And the molecule is tumbling. 
So motion is no longer pristine and pure. The spins, with time, they will lose their phase coherence. Yeah, aap isra dekh le, bhoot se dor mein wale, ek dor mein akathe shub ho te. Lekin har ek speed mein koi kutu fark hai. Thik hai? Aur vak ke saat saat, woh fark numaya hota jata hai. Woh difference hunga badhta rata hai, hunki distance hunki tata hai. So gradually with the passage of time, the spins lose their coherence, their ability of being in phase. This is the T2 process. It has nothing to do with T1 relaxation. Both of these processes are going on independently. So gradually the spins lose their coherence. So why do they lose their coherence? One, the field can be inhomogeneous. So different spins in different regions of the test tube have different Lama frequencies. When they have different Lama frequencies, they will lose phase. Second is that each spin sees an, a different effective magnetic field. And why is that? Because the molecule is tumbling, the spin is near an electron cloud, is near some bonding orbital. Mm -hmm. So it is seeing a different uh, effective magnetic field. Now there are two kinds of spin relaxation. This is also an answer to your question. One is homogeneous broadening and the other is inhomogeneous broadening. In any kind of molecular spectroscopy, you have to understand the difference between these terms. Achha, homogeneous broadening is that one spin, one signal, which the awaaz was, even if there was no field in homogeneity, even if there were no field in homogeneity, that magnetization will decay. Okay? Because of these, because the effective magnetic field at each spin in different molecules is different. Okay? But, and this causes the broadening of this peak. So even if you have a perfect instrument, there will always be some broadening. This is called homogeneous broadening. The other kind is called inhomogeneous broadening. In inhomogeneous body, this is what is happening. You have a suppose you have a test tube. ठीक है उसमें different slices ले लें water के एक ये slice एक ये slice ठीक है अब अगर तो field homogeneous है along the length of the test tube along the different slices you will have the same Lama frequency but the magnetic field is not homogeneous along the length of the solenoid. It will be more homogeneous near the, these, end, these fringes because you can never make a perfect solenoid. The field will always be inhomogeneous. One, this test tube is made of glass and there is air here, glass here and a water here. Water has a certain dielectric constant. What is the dielectric constant of water? AT. Glass has a certain dielectric constant it has, and air has a certain dielectric constant. Because of the different dielectric constants, there is a permeability mismatch and that permeability mismatch causes inhomogeneous magnetic fields. So the field is not homogeneous along the sample. So, so there is a peak originating from this slice, there is a peak at a different long of frequency originating from the other slice and gradually the more inhomogeneous parts of the sample also give a peak that is very broad. right? because the field is very inhomogeneous here. Now when you have a broad peak, the height of the signal goes down. Because the area under the signal is coming from the number of the spins. And that has to remain constant in certain slides. So this effect is called inhomogeneous broadening. And you can control the inhomogeneous broadening by controlling the homogeneity of, of your magnetic field. But it's very difficult to control homogeneous broadening. Because homogeneous broadening comes from the temperature, it comes from the molecule itself, it comes from the texture of the molecule, it comes from the motional aspects of the molecule. And so that's not within our control. Now there are two famous experiments. One is the inversion recovery experiment that I showed you in the previous slide. That was used for measuring T1. The real spur in magnetic resonance, the real spur in magnetic resonance comes from the phenomenon of spin echo. And this is what enables NMR and MRI. 
and enables it to become such a useful thing. It's a beautiful experiment. And the beauty is amplified because now you understand the notation of states. Now you understand the notation of density matrices. And we can understand what's going on. Now we do a calculation of this pulse sequence. It's a very beautiful experiment. I hope you will enjoy this. So let's see how this experiment takes place. Now this experiment effectively measures, measures T2, the spin-spin relaxation. कुछ रीडिंग मटेरियल मैंने बाकी साल को दिया था वो फ्री आपको मिल जाएगा वो और ये मैंने प्रेजेंटेशन भी अपलोड कर दिया है इस लाइव की साइट पर अच्छा तो दिस इस आर पल्स सीक्वेंस यू बन 90 डिग्री पल्स अ डिले a 180 degree pulse and the same amount of delay and we are acquiring the signal here. So let's follow this pulse sequence using the language of density operators and states. Very simple. But the most remarkable experiment in NMR it was done in the 1960s by, Ed, by Hahn. One of the most popular experiments. Your initial state is IZ. What happens when you apply an 90 degree pulse? Minus now you are waiting for a certain amount of time, tau over 2. Okay, now if we look at the block sphere on the equatorial plane, I draw it. This is x, y. Your initial state is minus i, y. You have precession clockwise precession about the z-axis because there is still do not feed and the frequency supposes omega the rotating frame frequency now what is the state that you get here? 1 minus, minus i by cosine frequency omega tau over 2 okay. so you start off here and you are with time, you are going in, in anti-clockwise fashion. Agreed? This is what happens under the action of the Hamiltonian omega naught IZ. So your spin state is minus I by cosine of this plus I X sine of your frequency and your time. It's a simple vector model that we studied in the previous three lectures. So what about the T1 relaxation? Won't it so we are ignoring T1 relaxation <coughs> in this. We are assuming that these times are very small as compared to T1 relaxation. Good question, but we are ignoring it here. So if we include the factor of T1, we can write the uh, evolution, but we are ignoring it. Good question, I like it. Uh, so this state is after time to over 2. Now you apply a 180 degree pulse with a phase y. Now the phase is very important, remember. Because that determines if you had a 90 y pulse, you would get an i x. Now you apply a 180 degree pulse along the y axis. How will you state change? i y ke kuch hoga? Kuch nahi hoga. Now you wait for another period tau over 2. Okay, you have to wait again for the same amount of time tau over 2. So what happens to minus i by minus i by goes to minus i by cosine tau over 2 plus i x sine omega tau over 2 and this will be with all the cosine will be done.
ठीक है आई वाई इस तरह इवॉल्व हो रहा है और आई वाई बीन मॉड्यूलेटेड बाई दिस टर्म
ठीक है टी टू रिलैक्सेशन हो रही है जिसकी वजह से उस वेक्टर की लेंथ डिक्रीज हो रही है देखो हम इफेक्टिवली स्पिन को रिफोकस करें अब देखो हर स्पिन की अपनी एक प्रोसेशनल फ्रीक्वेंसी है बिकॉज ऑफ इनहोमोजिनस ब्रॉडनिंग हर स्पिन एक मैग्नेटिक एक डिफरेंट रीजन ऑफ सैंपल में मैग्नेटिकली डिफरेंट है तो वक्त गुजरने के साथ साथ स्पिन अगरचे इकट्ठे शुरू हुई लेकिन दे विल फैन आउट इन टाइम बिकॉज ऑफ द इनहोमोजिनस ब्रॉडनिंग They will fan out in time. और बाद में ये फैनिंग आउट बढ़ती जाएगी ना तो जब ये फैनिंग आउट बॉडीज का मतलब इनका वेक्टर सामने वो डिक्रीज हो रहा है नो यू आर इंक्रीजिंग द फैनिंग आउट राइट सो विद टाइम द फैनिंग आउट इज इंक्रीजिंग सो यू वेट फॉर अ टाइम टाउ बाई टू एंड यू गेट दिस स्टेट दिस इज बिकॉज ऑफ इन होमोजीनियस ब्रॉडिंग because the spins are in different regions of the sample they seeing different amounts of magnetic field every one has a different lambda frequency then what happens ha ab aapne 180 degree pulse apply ki along by theek hai ye spin is taraf aa gayi ठीक है और जब वन एटी डिग्री पास करने के बाद मैंने दोबारा उसको उतने ही देर के लिए प्रिसेस, प्रिसेस करने दिया तो वो जो फैनिंग आउट थी वो अनफैन हो गए सब स्पिन में ठीक है अब देखें ये जो इफेक्ट है फैनिंग आउट का ये हमने कैंसिल आउट कर दिया ठीक है तो टी टू की जो इन होमोजेनस कॉम्पोनेट है इन होमोजेनस ब्रॉडनिंग वाला कॉम्पोनेट है We have in fact eliminated it altogether. So any inhomogeneity in the magnetic field has been totally reversed or eliminated. We have gotten rid of inhomogeneous plotting, but we haven't gotten rid of homogeneous plotting. So the next slide exemplifies that. If you have only inhomogeneous plotting, if you have only inhomogeneous plotting. so this is your initial magnetization right it decays with time with a 180 degree pulse and you wait for the same amount of time it comes back to its original height it comes back to its original strength <coughs> so this is what a spin echo pulse sequence does in the presence of only inhomogeneous broadening it eliminates any inhomogeneous broadening theek hai however the homogeneous broadening the homogeneous broadening which means that a spin even if the field was perfectly homogeneous even if the field was perfectly homogeneous it decays with time the magnetization decays with time that effect cannot be reversed right so one question that i would like to ask you let's move back to this slide if you have a slice here and you apply a spin echo sequence this is spin in the on this slice you <laughs> see an effective magnetic field which is different from the from the spin on different slices now you apply the spin echo pulse sequence to this test tube of water consider this slice what is happening is that the spin is processing with a certain frequency take the frequency you have a 180 degree pulse apply ki यहां से शुरू है ठीक है माइनस आई वाई से ये माइन पार पार यहां से शुरू है ठीक है यहां है फिर आपने बाय एक्सिस के लॉन्ग एट वन एटी के पास भाई आप वापस इधर चले फिर आप उतनी देर के लिए इंतजार किया तो आप माइनस आई वाई वाई स्टेट पर जाए 
ठीक है जो हायर स्लाइस पे आप यहीं से शुरू हुए लेकिन आपने ज्यादा प्रिसेस कर लिया क्योंकि फील्ड शायद ज्यादा थी यहाँ पे बिल्फर फील्ड ज्यादा थी उसने ज्यादा प्रिसेस कर लिया लेकिन 180 डिग्री पल्स अप्लाई की आप इधर आ गए और उतनी देर में जाकर माइनस आई बाई पे दोबारा आ गए ठीक है अब इस स्लाइस पर और इस स्लाइस पर प्रिसेशन फ्रिक्वेंसी डिफरेंट है अब स्पिन एक्ो सीक्वेंस में अगर यहाँ पे जो मॉलिक्यूल है ड्यूरिंग द स्पिन एक्ो सीक्वेंस इट डिफ्यूजेस एंड गोज टू अनदर सेक्शन ऑफ द टेस्ट ट्यूब द स्पिन एक्ो सीक्वेंस विल नॉट वर्क ऑफ इट बिकॉज इन द फर्स्ट हाफ ऑफ द स्पिन एक्ो सीक्वेंस इट सीन वन इफेक्टिव फील्ड एंड इन द सेकेंड हाफ इट सीन a different effective magnetic field so the enemy of the spin echo sequence is the diffusion process of the molecules theek okay, hai so one assumption is that we are ignoring t1 the second assumption is that we are ignoring diffusion so diffusion nmr is a very hot area and there are ways to compete with diffusion as well as no problem to so, nmr p aam to p isra ki dikhai dete hain इसकी एक वेस्ट है टाउ टी टू टी टू उसकी एक जितना आपका स्पिन स्पिन रिलैक्सेशन टाइम है उसी के इन्वर्सिव पोर्शन वेट है और इस टी टू के अंदर होमोजेनस कंपोनेंट भी है इन होमोजेनस कंपोनेंट भी है और अगर आप स्पिन है कुछ सीक्वेंस अप्लाई करेंगे तो दिस पीक विल श्रिंक दिस पीक विल श्रिंक बिकॉज नाउ द इन होमोजेनस कॉम्पोनेंट है पीक रिमेन्स मेट्रिक If right, the peak remains symmetric in both cases, but there are other reasons which make the peak asymmetric. So this is the Fourier transform of a decaying exponential. It's called the Lorentzian. Now, how do we plot the NMR spectrum? Now we come to practical issues. and when we come to practical issues of of nmr spectroscopy there are a lot of conventions because chemist the nmr has been there for 30 40 years been been used by chemists all the time has been there for 50 60 years has been used by chemists all the time to baaz oqat kisi cheez ka istemal uski puri samajh se usko puri tarah उस पर अकल अभी पूरी तरह गिरफ्त नहीं कर पाती कि हम उस चीज़ का इस्तेमाल शुरू करें एन एम आर भी एक ऐसी टेक्निक है जिसमें ट्रेडिशन और हिस्ट्री बहुत सी चीज़ों को डिक्टेट करता है और बहुत सी कन्वेंशन एन एम आर स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी में शामिल होती हैं और एक अच्छा कैमिस्ट उन कन्वेंशन को अप्रीशिएट करता है और स्टिक करता है अब हम कन्वेंशन के अब हम एन एम आर स्पेक्ट्रम प्लॉट कैसे करते हमें पता है कि गैमा नेगेटिव भी हो सकता है पॉजिटिव भी हो सकता है और ओमेगा इज माइनस गैमा भी ठीक है अगर गैमा नेगेटिव है ओमेगा पॉजिटिव हो गया ना ठीक है सबसे पहले हम नीचे वाली एग्जाम्पल देखें पर मेंशन इतनी है कि हर बंदा कंफ्यूज हो जाता है बशीमुल मेरे गैमा जब पॉजिटिव है ओमेगा नेगेटिव है ठीक है तो इफ यू प्लॉट द रोटेटिंग फ्रेम फ्रीक्वेंसी ओमेगा हैज टू बी नेगेटिव सो यू गेट अ पीक एट माइनस 1 किलो हर्ट्ज तो दिस इज रोटेटिंग फ्रेम फ्रीक्वेंसी इट्स नॉट द लॉ ऑफ फ्रीक्वेंसी यू आर सबट्रैक्टिंग इट फ्रॉम अ ट्रांसमीटर और अ रेफरेंस फ्रीक्वेंसी ओके सो ओमेगा इज नेगेटिव Now here, gamma is negative. Omega has to be positive. Right? So this should really be plus one kilohertz. I'm sorry for this. This should be plus one kilohertz. This is plus one kilohertz. 
ठीक है एंड दिस ओमेगा शुड बी पॉइंटिंग इन द ऑपोजिट डायरेक्शन सो देयर इज अ एरर दैट आई एम गोइंग टू ऑल राइट नाउ लेट्स लुक एट दिस इंपॉर्टेंट मॉलिक्यूल व्हिच फॉर्म्स अ रेफरेंस फॉर ऑल एनएमआर स्पेक्ट्रा टीएमएस टेट्रामिथाइल साइलिन सिलिकॉन अ टेट्रा टेट्राहेड्रल कंपाउंड विद फोर मेथिल ग्रुप्स टेट्राहेड्रल Now, what do we mean by an isotopomer? An isotopomer is a molecule in which one nucleide is replaced with another isotope. For example, silicon has two isotopes: silicon 28, natural burden 95 percent, and silicon 29, natural burden about 4 percent. We have carbon, carbon 12, natural burden 99 percent, carbon 13, natural burden. One percent roughly. So, <clears throat> let's look at these isotopomers. Silicon twenty-eight has no spectrum of its own. Silicon twenty-eight is spin zero nucleus. Okay, but silicon twenty-nine is a spin half nucleus. All right. Now let's look at this isotopomer in which everything is natural abundance. Everything is natural abundance. All right. Now the only peak that is coming is from the protons. Now how many how many protons does this molecule have? Ten, twelve, no, twelve. Okay. But all of these twelve protons are giving just one peak because all the twelve protons are chemically and magnetically equivalent. There is no difference between the twelve protons. We will have more to say about equivalence. But all those twelve protons. Are giving you a peak at certain frequency. Now here I am plotting omega, the Lamo frequency. Since gamma is negative for a proton, the gamma is positive. Sorry, gamma is positive for a proton. The Lamo frequency is negative, so I am plotting it at minus 400 megahertz. So from this isotopomer, this is spectrum that I get. ठीक है? अच्छा. और इस स्पेक्ट्रम के इस पीक का कोई एरिया होगा दिस मस्ट बी सम इंटीग्रल और सम एरिया अंडर दिस पीक दैट एरिया टेल्स अस हाउ मेनी प्रोटॉन्स डू वी हैव इफ यू हैव अ रेफरेंस कंपाउंड फॉर व्हिच वी नो द नंबर ऑफ प्रोटॉन्स एंड यू कंपेयर दिस एरिया अंडर दिस पीक विद अनदर रेफरेंस पीक यू कैन टेल हाउ मेनी प्रोटॉन्स डज दिस डज दिस आइसोटोपोमर हैव Right? It's always important to look at the area under the peak, not the height of the peak. The area under the peak is a measure of the signal strength, not the height. Why? Because homogeneous broadening can decrease the height. When the height decreases, the full width half maximum increases, so that the area remains constant. So you always measure the area under the peak. In NMR, it's also called the integral under the peak. Now let's look at another isotopomer. Which occurs with an abundance of about four percent because twenty-nine silicon has an abundance of about four percent. Now you have peaks from uh, the protons, from the twelve protons, and a peak from the silicon atom. Now the silicon atom has a negative gyromagnetic ratio, so the Lamo frequency turns out to be positive. So now, if you look at the NMR spectrum of this isotopomer. Somehow you have a sample in which only this isotopomer exists. You will get this spectrum. Now you are detecting two frequencies: one at minus 400 megahertz and the other at 79.5 megahertz. In a real spectrometer, it's not possible to have one coil. It's very hard, or not impossible. It's very difficult to have one coil that can detect at both of these frequencies. <coughs> that is doubly tunable to both of these. Frequencies. So generally, you have two separate coils. One coil for, for example, a proton, and one coil for silicon. So you get a probe that has two channels: one for silicon and one for proton. So generally, when you do carbon 13 NMR as well as proton NMR, your probe is fitted with two channels: a coil for carbon, which is optimized for carbon, and a coil that is optimized for proton. Anyways, that's A technical point, but there uh, there can be another isotope, uh, another isotopomer, in which 
one of the carbons, in which one of the carbons is replaced by a carbon 13. That has a probability of 1%. There will be other isotopomers in which two carbons are carbon 13, but that has a probability of 0.1%. Three carbons, uh, carbon 13 has 0.01%, so I'm not plotting those. So if you look at this uh, isotopomer, you have a peak from the protons, a peak from the carbon 13, from the single carbon 13 that is NMR active. That's it. ठीक है? अब आप ये देखें कि ये gyromagnetic ratio of carbon 13 is also positive, leading to a negative Lamo frequency. And the gyromagnetic ratio of carbon is about one fourth that of proton. So if you get a 400 megahertz signal for proton, you get a 100 megahertz signal on the same spectrometer for carbon. So real uh, tetramethylsilane TMS, which used as a reference compound in NMR because it's very stable, the protons, a large number of protons, you get a big signal, you can make it in liquid form. It, it's chemically inert, it does not really react much because it's saturated. So if you look at the natural abundance spectrum from TMS, from tetramethylsilane, this is what you get. And this will be a mixture of the spectra from all of these isotopomers in the correct ratios. So somehow you can synthesize a molecule which is very possible, which is of this form which is enriched in protein silicon, you get predominantly this. But those labeled molecules are very expensive. And you make them by radioisotopic methods. Okay. All right. So to add to the convention and to add to the confusion, and it's my responsibility to, to share those conventions with you, not to confuse you, but to highlight these conventions is that this the top is a plot of the Lamo frequency. Positive gyromagnetic ratio means a Lamo frequency that is negative. Proton and carbon, the most popular NMR nuclei have positive gyromagnetic ratios. Now we know that in the super heterodyne down conversion we have to multiply the signal with a reference frequency which is the transmitter frequency. So the transmitter frequency can be, that's our choice. The transmitter frequency is our choice. What frequency are you transmitting the signal at? It's our choice. So we can place the transmitter frequency or the reference frequency anywhere that we like. Okay? So if we define the convention that the offset omega is given by the Lamo frequency omega naught minus the reference frequency, then this omega can be positive or negative as we desire. If, if we consider this case, then omega naught, now this is negative, omega naught is greater than omega f. Remember this is the negative part. So this makes capital omega positive. If omega transmitter is placed at this peak, this peak will occur at zero here. If the transmitter frequency or the reference frequency is placed on the right side of this peak, this peak will become negative. So the choice of this reference frequency is up to us. So this is the case of positive gyromagnetic ratios. So either minus carry magnitude minus carry or actually with signs. फिर नेगेटिव जायरोमैग्नेटिक रेशियोस के साथ भी बिल्कुल ऐसा ही करते हैं। लेकिन जब आप प्लॉट करने की बारी आती है ना नेगेटिव जायरोमैग्नेटिक रेशियोस को तो आप फ्लिप करते हैं इसपे। तो आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू बिलेवर ऑन दिस पॉइंट इन इन दिस इन इन दिस लेक्चर यू कैन लुक इट अप अब एक चीज जिसके बारे में आज पर्दा को शाही करूंगा और अगली दफा जिसके बारे में तफसील से बात करूंगा केमिकल शेप हमने जाइलीन के केस में देखा किसी भी मॉलिक्यूल के केस में देखें कार्बन 13 है बहुत से उस मॉलिक्यूल 
के अंदर प्रोटॉन्स हैं बहुत से उस मॉलिक्यूल के अंदर लेकिन हर प्रोटॉन हर कार्बन थर्टीन अपनी खास लामो फ्रिक्वेंसी पर और वो एक दूसरे से मुख्तलिफ है खास फील्ड परफेक्टली होमोजेनस है उसकी वजह है केमिकल शिफ्ट एवरी एनएमआर एक्टिव न्यूक्लियस हैज अ केमिकल शिफ्ट इज अफेक्टेड बाय केमिकल शिफ्ट नाउ द ओरिजिन ऑफ द केमिकल शिफ्ट विल डिस्कस इन डिटेल बट बेसिकली व्हाट हैपेंस इज दैट वी हैव अ न्यूक्लियस स्पिन इज सराउंडेड बाय एन इलेक्ट्रॉन क्लाउड दैट इलेक्ट्रॉन क्लाउड कुड बी द बॉन्डिंग ऑर्बिटल्स द मॉलिक्यूलर ऑर्बिटल्स द बॉन्डिंग मॉलिक्यूलर ऑर्बिटल्स और दे कुड बी द एटॉमिक ऑर्बिटल्स नाउ you place this electron cloud and inside the electron cloud is a we have perched a nucleus you place it inside a magnetic field now these electrons are charged so <coughs> they, there is an electro dynamic force that acts on these electrons because of the magnetic field and these electrons generate their own magnetic field so the effective magnetic field that the electron that the nucleus sees is not the same as beam this process is called chemical shift because it is the same electrons the same valence electrons or the electrons in the molecular orbitals that are determining the chemical properties of the molecule that are also controlling the nuclear lamo frequencies so this phenomenon is called chemical shift and there are two ways of representing chemical shift we know that omega is minus gamma b not but in the presence of chemical shift this formula is slightly modified by 1 plus delta and this delta is called the d shielding parameter this is a very small number of the order of 10 to the power minus 6 or minus 5 very small number. is another convention and that convention is omega equals minus gamma b not 1 minus sigma this sigma is called the shielding parameter theek hai ab ye mera kusoor nahi ye ek tareekh hame sab ko dikhta hai ki ye convention tha so this is called the shielding parameter it's just equal to minus that and these are small numbers and as a first approximation we are treating them to be numbers really they are tensors but let's say that these are numbers all right so the last 2 3 minutes if you look at ethanol so if we forget the hydroxyl line the proton attached to the hydroxyl line and assume for a minute that this ethanol Uh, this hydroxyl line is undergoing chemical exchange or it's involved in hydrogen bonding there are two protons in the methylene group and three protons in the methyl group now th these three protons are equivalent there is no difference between them because this terminal uh, functional group is rotating it has a certain symmetry c3 d symmetry you read molecular uh, symmetry uh, you have taken classes in symmetry and these two protons are totally chemically and magnetically equivalent now there is a bunch of peaks don't worry why these peaks are split but there there is a peak <coughs> that comes from the ch3 and there is a peak that comes from the ch2 these peaks are coming from uh, the ch2 the methylene protons and these peaks are coming from the methyl protons the CH three protons, and you can immediately guess that the integral under this this uh, peak is three is in a ratio of three to two with respect to this because there are three protons in the methyl group and two protons in the methylene group. Forget why these are split. We will discuss that later. But these three protons have a different chemical shift than these two protons because the local electronic environment for these protons is different from these three. In other words, the chemical shift is different. Likewise, we can discuss the carbon thirteen spectrum. So, if this carbon thirteen is enriched 
you get one isotope homer, if the other is enriched, you get a different isotope homer and you can combine the two spectra. The last slide for today. अगर हम ethanol ही की बात करें, तो isotopomers कौन से possible हैं? One isotopomer is that this is a carbon 13. The other possible isotopomer is that this is a carbon 13. Each one of these has a natural abundance of one percent, and the probability that both of them are enriched is point zero one percent. One percent or one point zero one percent. So we can ignore that. So natural abundance ethanol. If you take a carbon thirteen spectrum, you will get two peaks. One here, the other here. Now there is a certain separation between these peaks. A certain separation between these peaks, which is about two kilohertz. Which is about two kilohertz. Okay. Alright, now this spectrum was acquired at a certain B0 field. This is a spectrum acquired at a field of say 5 Teslas, for example. Okay. This is from one isotope, this is from the other isotope. Now you increase the magnetic field. You increase the magnetic field, the separation between these peaks also increases in units of frequency. So the chemical shift of these peaks, these peaks are shifted from one another because of chemical shift. Now you increase the magnetic field, this chemical shift increases. If here the chemical shift difference is about 2 kilohertz, here the chemical shift difference is 4 kilohertz because the B0 field has increased. Right? Now increasing the magnetic field increases the chemical shift. तो B0 इंक्रीज कर दें, तो ये खा कुछ भी हो, B ओमेगा विल इंक्रीज, the frequency separation between those chemically shifted peaks will increase just by virtue of this formula. Agree? You double B0, the ओमेगा भी डबल। ये बात समझ आ गई सर? ठीक है? अच्छा, अब देखो हम एक NMR स्पेक्ट्रम लेते हैं। 200 मेगाहर्ट्ज की लामो फ्रीक्वेंसी पे और हम कहते थे केमिकल शिफ्ट इस 2 किलोहर्ट्ज अब वो सैंपल आपने मुझे दे दिया अब मेरे पास 400 मेगाहर्ट्ज का स्पेक्ट्रोमीटर है मैं वो स्पेक्ट्रम रन करता हूँ तो आई गेट एस फ्रीक्वेंसी सेपरेशन ऑफ़ 4 किलोहर्ट्ज सो देर इस सम नीड देर इस सम रीजन टू � So for that, we use a different scale, which is called the PPM scale, parts per million scale. And that tells us that the separation between these peaks is given by a frequency independent parameter, which is called the PPM parameter. And this is uh, the scale on which most of the spectra are plotted. So in the next lecture, we'll start, up, start with this scale, look at certain examples. And then we will look at how chemical shift actually takes place. What is the shielding effect? We look at the chemical shifts of different functional groups. We will look at conventions, we look at example spectra, the role of symmetry. And finally, we will talk about splittings in the next lecture. But here you are observing that even though the magnetic field increases and the chemical shift frequency difference in absolute units is decreasing, the finest structure of these peaks remains the same. So the finest structure of these peaks, the splittings have nothing to do with the external field. They have to do with another phenomenon which is called spin-spin coupling. So thank you very much for your attention. As you mentioned that to the distant peaks on the frequency axis cannot be detected with the same coil. So how about exciting to fairly distant peaks on the frequency axis? It's equally difficult. Because you have to, it's a maximum power transfer theorem. You have to transfer power to the scales. And the coil has to be tuned to a certain frequency. If the coil is tuned to a resonant frequency, maximum power will be delivered to, to, one particular to the particular space. Likewise for reception. 
So it's equally difficult to transmit and to receive. But you can make, I'm not denying the possibility of making multiple tuned coils. That's an art in itself. Any more questions? 